that's a great question. I never taught here, but um, no. Let's 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 try this. Wait, wait. The easy thing to do is to just close this without saving and then open it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> right. I was gonna use the back side of oh, this. Oh, okay, okay. I thought that the easy thing is to just close this. Oh, it's still here. It's, still here. <laughs> it's forever. Okay. You see? Good. Good. Cool. Uh, no, then I'll use this. I was asking spiders for a marker. So spiders just a pen there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is good. Mark up. Yes. Yes. I think you're fine, right? Yes. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Kanat Basu from UT Dallas. Um, Kanat Basu received his PhD from the Department of Computer and Information Science and Engineering from University of Florida. And his thesis, was fo his thesis focused on improving signal observability for post-silicon validation. Post-PhD, Dr. Basu worked in various semiconductor companies like IBM and Synopsys. And during his PhD days, he interned at Intel. Um, and currently, he's an assistant professor at, uh, at the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at uh, the UT Dallas, where he leads the Trustworthy and Intelligent Embedded Systems Lab. Prior to this, uh, he was an assistant research professor at NYU. He has authored one book, two US patents, two book chapters, and uh, many, many uh, conference and journal, pub journal papers. Uh, he has been awarded with the Best Paper Award at the LSI Design 2011. Um, and his research has been covered by many um, news agencies such as NBC Austin and CBS Dallas Fort Worth. Kanat's uh, current research interests are hardware and system security, as well as deep learning hardware. And I believe this is going to be a very interesting talk. Thanks so thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Aydin. Can everybody hear me? I believe everybody can, right? Let me just put it in my pocket. Just give me a moment. I've been told that I need this mic for recording purposes. Otherwise, I think my voice is loud enough for everybody to hear it. So, uh, okay. So let's start today's talk. Thanks, Aydin, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about antivirus hardware. And I believe for most of you, if not for all of you, this will be our first time you are hearing this word, phrase, antivirus hardware, right? So we'll go into details and see what is this. So before I begin, I have to introduce my students here in my lab. And a significant portion of the work that we are going to talk about today has been done by my first PhD student, Mr. Abraham Kuruvilla. Abraham will be defending next month, and he will probably join Intel. He hasn't confirmed yet. So he'll probably join Intel in the Threat Detection Technology Group. Uh, so I'm really grateful to him for doing most, some of the work that we are going to describe today. So this is the outline of our talk. First, we'll talk about two security aspects, system security and hardware security. Although you can see the div division, but you can clearly see system security occupies most of the presentation, right? So we'll spend significant more amount of time on system security, maybe 90% of the time on system security, and briefly go over hardware security. So let's see what the challenges of system security are. We live in a world of Internet of Things or IoT, where each and every aspect of our everyday lives are connected to the Internet, right? I see somebody has a tablet here, so you can check your emails in your tablet, on your cell phone, on your smartwatch. You can have a smart pacemaker, which is connected to the internet. The power grids are connected to the internet. Your car is connected to the internet. Everything is connected to the internet. As a result, these devices are susceptible under malicious software or malware. So all of us have heard the term virus at some point of our time, life, right? But virus is a subclass of something called malware. Malware means malicious software. So mal I will describe more about malware very shortly, but how do you prevent yourself against malware? At some point of your time, you have used antivirus software, right? If you have used Windows machine, probably those using Mac machines haven't used them, but you have used antivirus software. And I'm pretty sure the NC State IT department has a lot of antivirus software to protect themselves against malware. However, antivirus softwares have two major problems. And as a result, Symantec, one of the top security companies, of top security expert, they said that antivirus software is dead. Number one, antivirus software are vulnerable against modern robust malware. We'll describe how and why. But antivirus software, the, the major problem is antivirus software can be fooled by, by new malware that the adversaries are developing. 
And as a result, you can see every day if you open the news article, you will see some cyber attacks happening at some point of some part of US. Forget the world. It's happening everywhere in the world. But in US also, every day some sort of cyber attacks are happening. The other problem is, as I was mentioning, a lot of IoT devices are battery operated, low powered, right? Now, remember when we were using an antivirus software on a Windows computer that slows down your machine? Especially those of you who have used a Windows Vista machine will remember this very carefully, right? The machine used to slow down a lot. Now, the same thing, if you imagine putting an antivirus software on a battery operated device, like a smart pacemaker, that hardly has any power. If you run an antivirus software on top of that, either you have to increase the power, make the device larger, which is not feasible, or you have to make it unprotected which is dangerous, because if somebody hacks into a smart pacemaker, the patient can die, right? So these are the two challenges of antivirus software in the modern society. Moving on, the second challenge that we are going to talk about today is hardware security. This is a very simplistic design flow of how a hardware is designed. So you have the register transfer level netlist, the get level netlist, all your VHDL and Verilog codes which you've studied in undergrad or grad school. Then you have the placement and layout which you get the GDS2 files, do fabrication, get the chip, then you do testing, post silicon validation, package and assembly, and then uh, send it to the customer. Now, in old days, like pre-globalization, for example, let's consider IBM, used to make everything themselves, right? IBM used to make ev all, the, all these parts will be themselves. Nowadays, that's not the case. A lot of fabless companies have come in. So people, for economic reason, don't own their own fabrication facility. They use a third-party fabrication facility to manufacture their chip. Right? For example, Apple and Qualcomm are fabless companies. Does anybody here know who Apple uses for manufacturing the chip? Which, uh, yes? AMD. Not exactly. I, Apple uses Samsung. <laughs> and you can clearly understand that Samsung and Apple have a huge rivalry, right? I'm not saying Samsung is doing anything to Apple. Probably they're not. But if Samsung wants, Samsung can jeopardize Apple's chips and suddenly see your iPhone breaks down after one year. You blame Apple, but it's not Apple who has to blame. So what are the challenges that happens due to this distributed form of IC development? Counterfeit ICs, overproduction, reverse engineering, and hardware trojans. We're going to discuss each of them towards the end of the presentation. So first, let's go into system security. So malware, as I was mentioning, malware or malicious software are there everywhere. There are different kinds of malware. Virus is the most common form of malware that you have heard. Then there, is, uh, there are worms, there are botnets, there are rootkits, there are ransomware. And they can do a lot of things. They can steal money, they can uh, spy on data, they can infect a lot of devices and so on. So let's look at some of the examples of malware attack that has happened in the recent last two years. So University of Utah, which is a school like us, they have paid half a million dollars. That's like a grant, right? <laughs> so they paid half a million dollars to a ransomware attack. Otherwise, the student records would have been public. A large Florida school district in April this year was hit by a ransomware attack, and they had to, the hackers demanded $40 million. I don't know whether they actually paid it, because that news never came out. Acer, one of the leading laptop manufacturing companies, was targeted with $50 million ransomware attack. And a couple of years ago, 22 Texas towns were hit with ransomware attack. So you can clearly see, and every, as I said, after the presentation, you go back to Google and just type ransomware, you'll see some attack happening today. I'm pretty sure this is happening every day. So the number of malware signatures have been growing over the years. And this is not only restricted to PCs alone. The number of Android malware signatures have been growing also. There are 4 million unique Android malware samples every year in 2017. So now let's take a step back and try to understand why existing antivirus software fail against modern malware. So first, let's understand what are modern, how modern malware are different from the previous malware that we were seeing. So modern malware, which escaped the antivirus software, are two types, polymorphic and metamorphic malware. As you can clearly understand, it has the phrase morphic, which means modification, right? So both of them modify themselves. Polymorphic malware have a mutation engine, which change the structure of the malware, but not the behavior. Metamorphic malware rewrites itself in each iteration of the propagation. So the source code changes in each than the previous version, okay? Now let's understand why antivirus software cannot detect this. But before that, let's understand how antivirus softwares work. So traditional antivirus software are of two types, signature-based and behavior-based. Let's talk about signature-based first. 
So the signature-based antivirus software will create a signature from any software running on your system. Like, for example, we're running Microsoft PowerPoint right now, right? For, for your online classes, you use probably Zoom. You can use other software like a web browser like Chrome, Microsoft Word, or whatever. So when you use these type of softwares, what traditional antivirus software will do, the signature base, they will create a software signature from the executable. So while you're running the software from the executable, they'll create a signature, and it has a repository of all malware signatures. It will match these software signatures against the malware signature, okay? And if it sees a match, it will raise a flag. Clear? That's easy, right? So it can be subverted, because at the end of the day, it's a software. So any malware, malware is also a software, can actually escalate its privilege and subvert the effect of the antivirus software. The other point is it is ineffective for morphic malware. Let's take the example, and as Aydin was just mentioning a few minutes ago, we can take the, our mask and maskless example. So you can see here we have Spider-Man and Peter Parker, right? So imagine an ant a signature-based antivirus software creating a signature based on the face, right? If you just take the image of the face and try to recognize it, will you be able to identify the two? You won't, but they are one and the same person, right? So signature-based antivirus software are ineffective for morphic malware. And 99% of the antivirus software we use in our daily lives are signature-based. The other type is behavior-based antivirus software. So how does this work? They extract the software behavior. So they don't look at the structured or the executable, they look at the software behavior. Let me give you an example of what this is. Suppose you have a GPS malware in your GPS system, right? I don't know whether any of you have, are you still using the GPS system, but those like TomTom Tom GPSs that were there, so if you have a malware for the GPS, what will the, GPS, the malware do? The malware will infect the GPS, hide itself, log in the data, and transmit it outside. It will do all these functionalities irrespective of how you write the malware, right? So the behavior is that. The structure may change, but the behavior doesn't change. So behavior-based malware detectors can actually identify the software behavior, identify the malware behavior. And so it can easily identify who is Peter Parker and who is Spider-Man. That's good, right? Then why don't we use it? The reason we don't use it, they have a very high overhead. So it's not suitable for PCs, forget IoT devices. So it's typically used in the back end for research. So this creates a critical gap in existing system security, right? So how do we address this? So researchers tried to think of how to address this and came up with something called hardware-based malware detector or antivirus hardware, which we'll describe now. So hardware features are much more trusted compared to software. They're difficult to undermine. So although I talked about hardware security and I'm pretty sure Edin talks about hardware security all the time, but still, hardwares are much more difficult to undermine compared to software. That's a rule. Like you have to manually tamper the hardware to change the hardware other than Rohammer or some of the attacks. So it's much more difficult to temper a hardware compared to a software. So, and any program you run on a hardware will leave some hardware footprints. So you can leverage these hardware footprints to classify whether a program is a benign program or a malicious program. So that motivated people to use hardware as the root of, as the root of trust for detecting malware. So the first hardware that people came up with is hardware performance counters. Hardware performance counters are dedicated registers found in all computers, in everything, your uh, tablet, this PC, cell phone, everyone has hardware performance counters. These measure certain architectural or microarchitectural events, like number of branch misses, number of cache misses, and so on. So the whole idea was you can characterize a particular program using these HPCs, and then you can determine whether it's a benign or a malicious program. Since it is already there in the hardware, HPCs are already there in the hardware, you are not adding anything. It incurs zero hardware overhead. So let's see how this works. So we have plotted like several spec benchmark programs here, and we have plotted two HPCs, L1 exclusive hits and arithmetic microoperations executed, okay? So as you can see, each program has a characteristic variation of HPC. So you can clearly identify by the HPC you know, you will identify that this HPC variation correlates to this program, right? So that's the whole idea. You can create a signature out of these HPC variations. Now, this is not a thing of science fiction anymore. This has become a reality. Intel has actually demonstrated this in RSA conference 2021. <coughs> Sorry. So Intel's threat detection technology team used hardware telemetry through HPCs to detect crypto miners. And they could detect it through command line or as well as the uh, browser window. Okay, they used HPCs and they're trying to ramp up this whole procedure. 
So what we did? The first thing that we did is developing a theoretical model for HPC-based malware detector. Till us, before this work, people were just, people were just doing uh, empirical analysis. But is there a theoretical basis, the formal basis to understand this would work? So we developed a theoretical model, and we saw that the probability of detection of malware detection increases with increase in the number of HPC events. Let me stop my minute here and explain what this means. So any processor has multiple HPCs. For example, if you take a very small Raspberry Pi made of an ARM Cortex processor, that has 20 HPCs. However, at one instance, you can only simultaneously monitor four or six of them, not more than that, okay? Four is the maximum limit for most. So if you increase the number of HPC events you can monitor, that increases your malware detection. Of course, as I said, four is the maximum. The minimum is one, right, or zero. So you can, if you can increase the number of HPC events. And you can reduce the sampling interval, like how frequently you're measuring the HPCs. If you measure it every cycle, that's best, but that's not possible. So the more frequently you measure the HPCs, the higher the accuracy of detection. This paper appeared in IEEE tips last year. Now, machine learning can be used in conjunction with HPCs for malware detection. How is this done? Machine learning classifiers are trained on the HPC data. So you get a bunch of uh, malware and a bunch of benign programs, get their HPC data, train a machine learning classifier, and deploy them on the hardware-based malware detectors. And during these HMDs can detect this using, uh, during inference. Now the question is which machine learning classifiers are best? Which one should you use? Let's get to that. So first, let's uh, take a moment to understand how HPCs work, like uh, how you can collect HPCs. So in Linux, Linux tools command provides uh, accessibility to parse command. You can have to access this to sudo. So if you have a Linux machine in your home or in your lab, you can actually try this. So parf, uh, this is how the command looks like. So parf that a dot out is the executable, right? Most of us see is a dot out, and then branch instructions is the HPC that we are monitoring. Okay, so you can use this command and it will give you the number of branch instructions. So of course, you have to keep the a dot out program running. So instead of a dot out, what you can do is run the Firefox browser and get the HPCs for the Firefox browser. You will be able to see this. Okay. Okay, so this is our experimental setup. We used a Raspberry Pi 3 to, for our experiments. The reason is that you don't want to really run malware on your own PC, right? <laughs> so, and you cannot run malware on the network also. The UT Dallas admins will throw me out if I try to do that. So uh, the, the advantage of a Raspberry Pi is you can always flush the OS using a memory card. So once you run the program, get the HPCs, just flush the OS, that's fine. So we used a Raspberry Pi, So this was our experimental framework. We executed and collected uh, HPC values for 300 benign and malware. The benign program consisted of various sorting, computational algorithms, as well as spec benchmarks. And we obtained processor-specific malware from VirusShare. So VirusShare is a very interesting website. You can create a login and you can download real-life malware. And they will tell you, this is, these are ARM malware, these are x86 malware, these are Spark malware, and so on, okay? But please don't run it on your PC and then blame me. I wouldn't like that. So anyway. So the classifier comparison, we use seven different machine learning classifiers, and we varied the parametric parameters of each machine learning classifier and tried to see which is best. So these are the machine learning classifiers we used. Decision trees, knife bias, k nearest neighbor, linear regression, random forest, support vector machines, and neural networks. This paper actually appeared in ISVLSI last year. The random forest classifier furnished the best performance metric. And of course, if you utilize inferior parameters, can produce suboptimal results. This, this is what we used. That's the best results we plotted after varying different parameters. So, okay, so this is our training pipeline. This is the final goal, what we envision, what we are going to do. So we will have a bunch of malware, a bunch of benign programs, which we refer to as workloads. We'll train on various OS variants and train on various hardware platforms. And this pipeline will then create the model, which is platform agnostic, OS agnostic, malware invariant agnostic, and workload agnostic. And the last point we will describe next, adversarial machine learning res resilient, and we're going to deploy this. This is the final goal of us. This is what we tried, we are trying to achieve, okay? And we're not alone in this uh, task. Intel is actually working with us on this. So we have, a, we have a vision in mind. And in future, these machine learning, these hardware-based malware detectors are going to be deployed in various platforms. So we're going to talk about them. First, let's talk about adversarial attack. 
So for those of you who work or who do research on machine learning or work on machine learning, know that adversarial attacks are one of the biggest attack on machine learning these days, right? Even if you go to any machine learning conference like uh, AAAI or New Rips, or if you go to any um, uh, security conference like CCS or SNP, you'll see a lot of adversarial attack papers. So how can you do an adversarial attack on the machine learning system used in antivirus hardware? So adversaries have produced an attack that offers get the HPC traces. This is how they do. Let me explain this. So this consists of three steps. Reverse engineering the machine learning classifier, use adversarial sample predictor, and use adversarial sample generator. So how does this work? So basically, you can reverse engineering the machine learning classifier by, by using it as a black box. Remember the machine learning classifiers we're using? A random forest, small neural network. These are not CNNs or convolution neural network. These are very simple machine classifiers. So it's very easy to reverse engineer them, right? So once you reverse engineer them, what you do, you do some GAN-based computation to find out what adversarial sample will actually give a wrong result. And then you create that adversarial sample in a benign program. So you are running a malware, you run a benign program in the same thread, but those, that benign program creates those adversarial HPC values. Okay? And when you do that, the machine learning classifier gets confused and it produces wrong output. So how do you do that, generate that wrong HPC values? So for example, you can increase the branch misses by using dummy if statements. Just put dummy if statements, that false if statement, that will increase the branch misses. You can increase the last level cache load misses by loading an array, flushing it, and reloading it again, right? So when you do that, this, was, this is the accuracy drop that you obtain. So the accuracy drops by almost 10% when you apply this attack. And in this case, this is a significant loss. So how do we prevent against this? We developed a moving target defense against this. So what is a moving target defense? In the security community, moving target defense means you change the target of attack. You keep on rotating it so that the attacker who's trying to attack, he will be confused where the victim is, right? It's like, you know, how these competitions work where you have a target moving around and you're trying to shoot it or hit it with an arrow. You, don't, you cannot see the target constant, right? How do we do this? Remember I told you that a Raspberry Pi has 20 HPCs and at a time you can monitor only four of them? So we create multiple machine learning classifier, each with a different set of HPCs, right? And we use a random number generator which will randomly select these classifiers at any time instance. So if you do that, the adversary will not be able to reverse engineer the machine learning classifier. So the first step during adversarial attack was reverse engineering the machine learning classifier. So if the adversary fails to do that, he or she will not be able to do the rest of the process. So that's what we use here. So when we do, so we actually develop this, we develop this attack and we develop this uh, defense also. So this paper was uh, published in TCAD this year. Sorry, I should have mentioned it 2021. But uh, yeah, you can see that the accuracy after MTD is restored in the original accuracy. The original accuracy, the, after the drop, if you do this uh, defense, the moving target defense, the accuracy is restored. And we did a, did a theoretical computation where we showed that the probability that the machine learning classifier can be understood or guessed by the adversary is very low. It's 10 raised to minus 1750, okay? So that's, that's very low. Now let's talk about the next work that we did, which was time series-based malware detection. Traditional HMDs or hardware-based malware detectors don't account for temporal order. They look for each instance of time and put in a machine learning classifier and get the accuracy. It's like a combinational circuit, but there's a problem with that. It leads to high false positive rate. Now false positive rate is something which is very critical in a, in a malware detection system or any antivirus system. Because if your false positive rate is high, that means that basically any benign program you're running that will pop up as a malware, right? So imagine you are working on Zoom and suddenly your machine pops up and says you're running a malware. You wouldn't like that, right? So you have to reduce the false positive rate as much as possible. For example, PN scan, which is a popular botnet that incorporates this command called ping. Ping is a very popular command which all of us have used at some point of time, right? This is not a malware command, it's a benign command. And any malware comprises of a bunch of benign commands. So therefore, the false positive rate increases if you work by this way. The other problem that we faced is some devices have limited support for HPC, specifically the microcontrollers that were used in power electronics. And we are going to talk about that in a few minutes. Those are, those are very limited HPC supports. So some of them have just one HPC. So the TIC 2000 series has only supports clock cycles. So we tried to hit two targets with one arrow, that is temporal analysis, okay? 
So with respect to the transient order of data, we, what we did is we did a time series classifier. So this is a sequential approach. You're not looking at this instance alone, you're looking at what happened before, right? It's like the Avenger movie series, right? You always look at what happened in the past few movies till you understand what's happening here. So we are going beyond traditional, so statisticians will tell you that there is a time series classifier already. We developed our own time series classifier, which is fake TFT, okay? And we'll show what our results are. So we collected 300 HPCs, and we are working on a single HPC. Remember, we are not using four HPCs. We are working on a single HPC in these experiments. We use random forest classifier because that is the best machine learning classifier we just learned a few slides ago. We use time series forest, which is a traditional statistical time series analysis of random forest, and we proposed our set TFT. So these are our results. As you can see, initially with only one HPC, the accuracy was 60%, which is really bad. Because a 50% accuracy means a random guess, whether a program is a benign or a malware, right? 60% is really bad, because this is just a single HPC. If you apply four HPCs, this result would have been good, but again, we're working on the constraint of a single HPC. With a time series length of five, the accuracy increased to 75.71% on average. However, with SEC TFD, our proposed approach, it increased to 90%, 90.4%. So we can successfully improve accuracy using a single HPC using this approach. This paper has been accepted in host this year, and it will be presented in host sometime later this year, in December, I believe. So, but this is the whole uh, idea, that if you can use a time series based a sequential method, you can detect HPCs, with lim you can detect malware with limited capabilities and with higher accuracy, okay? So moving on. Let's now see H how HPCs can actually help in securing cyber physical systems. We'll talk about two of these. One is automotive and one is power grids. So let's look at automobile security. So I'm not sure how many of you know about the incident on the left. So in 2015, two white hat hackers did an experiment on a Jeep Cherokee. So for those of you who are not from the security community, a white hat hacker is a guy who actually finds out vulnerabilities in the systems and try to inform the world that this vulnerability exists before some adversary can exploit that and introduce some security risks, right? Like, for example, if you have a house and your door lock doesn't work well. If I come to your house as a friend and show you, oh, your door lock is wrong, that I'm a white attacker. Unless a thief comes in and breaks your door lock and robs you. So anyway, so two white attackers in St. Louis, Missouri did an experiment. One of the guys was sitting in an office like this. The other guy was driving on the St. Louis freeway, right? And this guy sitting in the office, was actually could control the car's brake and gas, right, from the office. So imagine you're driving on I-40 here, right? You're driving on I-40 here, you're going to the Smokies maybe through I-40, and then you suddenly see that your gas and brake are not in your control. Do you think there's a probability that you'll survive? You're driving at 80 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour. So it's very dangerous. Chrysler had to recall 1.4 million vehicles. And remember, these are not the cars. These are not self-driving cars. These are the cars we drive every day. We drive every day for commuting to work, for your home, to get our daily requirements. So if this kind of cars are hacked, we're really doomed, right? Fortunately, there are many more good people in the world than bad people, so we are still safe. The second picture you can see is a, is a ransomware that was created by McAfee, one of the leading so uh, antivirus company. They actually showed that this kind of attack is possible. They could uh, get this ransomware on your car and your car will be locked. Unless you pay money, ransomware, the name uh, you can understand, you have to pay ransom, right? You pay money, your car won't start. And recently, I'm not sure whether how many of you guys noticed this, uh, last year uh, the, in Minnesota, there was this, I think was, he was a high schooler. He hacked into a Tesla car without even touching it. So somebody just hacked into a Tesla car and drove it away. So, and there's a very good presentation by guys from KU Leuven, Belgium, where they showed that they can actually hack into a car from 50 feet away using remote access. So, and, and this is a life risk, right? Because you are driving your car at pretty high speed. The lift you can expect is somebody not tampering with your car. So what is the problem of automotive security? They have a, a plethora of potential attack vectors, as you can see the tire pressure monitoring unit, the EC or the electronic control unit, the infotainment system, the telematics unit, the keyless entry system. The more smarter the car is, the more susceptible it is to an attack. It's unfortunate, but that's true. 
So if any of you are driving a 1970s Buick, you're safe. So, so uh, the, the worst thing that can happen is compromising the electronic control unit or the ECU, right? Because the ECU is the main part that connects to the CAN bus in the car, and that connects to the brake and gas. So if somebody can hack into the ECU, you're doomed. So the attackers could cripple the brakes for eavesdropping the victim. Let me show you one of the attacks that we developed in our lab. So this is called a crankshaft modification attack. And this attack was actually done by a very good undergrad in my lab who actually, he developed this paper. This paper appeared in date this year in March. And he got a job in Tesla because of this paper. He really showed this paper to the Tesla folks and he got a job. So anyway, what he did is he did this experiment on his dad's Mitsubishi car, but I'm not encouraging you to do that. So, but anyway, he did this. So this is a crankshaft sensor. So he, produced, he gave wrong signal sensor inputs to the crankshaft sensors. So what happens if the crankshaft position ideally expects a value in the range of 1 to 24? So you can actually modify the crankshaft value, and you can give a wrong, erroneous value, like 0 or less or more than 24, 25 or 26. This results in the pistons valve from opening and closing for air. Long story short, it means your brakes will be applied slowly. So imagine you're driving, right, on I-40, and some, somebody suddenly hits a uh, brake, very fast brake, and you need to do that, otherwise you'll hit the front car, right? And when you do that, your, front, your brakes don't work as fast, your brakes work slow. Or if you're driving inside rally and you have a red signal, you suddenly need to hit the, red, the brakes. The brakes don't work, you pass on, right? This can be a life-threatening condition. So we actually demonstrated this attack, and we tried to see whether HPCs could detect the attack. The car actually has a lot of HPCs. The car is CU. We tried to develop uh, various machine learning techniques, and we saw that autoencoder performs the best among the various RPM variations. This work is actually in collaboration with Ford Motors in California, so we are working on them. We are trying to improve more of these. And this appeared in date this year, as I said. So moving on, securing power grids. So, oh, there's a clock that I'm, I was just looking at my mobile for the time. Okay, anyway. So let's see what, how the power grids are transforming. So electric grids are transforming these days. So they're becoming more decentralized, more dynamic, and more intelligent. Again, anything more intelligent means connecting to the internet and risky. So the main attack that can happen in electric grids is malicious firmware that can be launched in the electric grid. Some of you or most of you might have heard about the Stuxnet attack, which is one of the popular attacks on the electric grids. So what have malicious firmware can do? It can inhibit system functionality and cause inefficiencies. So this can cause severe damage to the grid by creating over voltage and over current scenarios. So we need to protect electric grids, right? Now the problem with applying HPCs directly into electric grids are they have very limited HPC support. So some devices don't even support HPCs because these grid controllers are all microcontroller based. They are, these are not processor or microprocessor based. So what we do, we propose custom built HPCs. And this is again, we are talking with TI because most of these microcontrollers are TI based. So TI is just our next door neighbors in Dallas. So what we're doing is, we are proposing this design for security primitives. We are saying that, okay, you don't have HPCs, but can you modify the microcontroller with maybe say 0.5% hardware overhead? That will secure your microcontroller much more. So we track the instruction sequence in the firmware. We'll talk about this and enable profiling malicious firmware. So let's look at first how the attacks are work. So we use this TI Piccolo IOSO control card for experiments. It controls the solar microinverter. So this is the solar microinverter. And we did erroneous parameter changes in the maximum power point tracking function. So the maximum power point tracking function is a function that is present in these microcontrollers. It looks at the photovoltaic cell panel, photovoltaic panel, PV panel, and tries to see what is the maximum power that can be obtained from it, right? So the, the experiment that we did was based on a perturb and observation, a PNO algorithm that's used in the MPPT. There are other algorithms that can be used. So we developed a denial of service attack, which repeatedly turns the functionality on and off. We developed two DOS attacks, one for shutting down the whole controller and one for the MPPT computation. We also developed an attack which will perturb the MPPT values. Okay, let's look at some of the effects. Yes, yeah, sure. That's a very good question. So the question is, can, uh, do we need a physical access to the controller or can be done over remote? So as long as you have a remote firmware update system, it can be done remotely. So if a grid controller is a modern controller which has a firmware update system over the air, it can be done remotely. 
But if, again, as I said, if you're using a 90s grid controller, yeah, you're safe, okay? So let's look at how this works. Look at the attack results. So these are the example of the DOS attacks. The DOS attacks actually result in brownouts, uh, load sheddings, and sometimes total power loss. So, and the perturbations attack actually destabilizes the controller and the power generation system, which results in a power instability, okay? So now let's talk about our solution, custom built HPCs. So what we did is, we obtained static disassembly of this instruction, of the microcontroller instruction using a disassembler. This will iterate to the assembly instructions. So we used five basic type of instruction types as our HPCs. Arithmetic, branch, store, load, and Boolean instructions. And their combinations. So for these five instruction types, there can be 25 combinations, like, like for example, arithmetic followed by branch, AB. Load followed by store, LS. And then store followed by store, SS. So we're looking at these combinations. So there are 30 HPCs we took into account. We use machine learning models to train custom built HPC data to identify this malicious firmware. And we also employ the time series classification, which is an interval based detection, which we'll talk about. So, results using custom built HPCs. So, we utilize TI's DIS 2000 disassembler for obtaining this static disassembly. And uh, we use train three machine learning models, decision tree, neural network, and random forest. These are our results. And as you can see, that random forest uh, performed the best, again, among all three. And this paper appeared at Elsevier Journal of Electric Power and Energy Systems. So then we used the time series classification. We did it in two steps. First, we did it for single HPCs. What when we take any single HPCs? Because remember, our time series classification was always a single HPC result, right? So what happens when we just take the instruction type? This is the results we get. And when using a custom built HPC, so we get over 90% accuracy, precision, and recall for branch, stored, and load instructions. This paper is under review in JetCast right now. And then we took a single HPC, but we're taking combinations. So arithmetic followed by branch and so on. And uh, we see the two combinations, branch plus load. This is actually giving 100% accuracy for all metrics. So branch plus load is the best HPC that we can use to detect this type of attack. Of course, this is just a very limited research that we have done till now. We have just considered one attack, and we have detected it. But we believe that this is the starting point. So we envision that future researchers can take forward from this work, or we are actually planning to take forward this work, attack, mi attack microgrids, and then find out, defend against them. Now let's talk about fine grain versus coarse grain HPCs. So HPCs, that what we were talking about till now, the branch misses, the cache misses, are coarse grain in nature due to bundling of events, right? As a result, it might not characterize an application properly, resulting in an increased false positive rates. This is a big weakness against cryptographic attack. Cryptographic attack means you change the cryptographic algorithm by introducing a weak, weak cryptography instead of a strong cryptography algorithm, okay? So it's still encrypting, but it's a weaker encryption. So to do this experiment, we benchmark post-quantum cryptography algorithms. So for those of you who are not aware of this, in the quantum era, existing cryptography algorithms like RSA won't work. So therefore, researchers have started new algorithms, developing new algorithms called post-quantum cryptography algorithm. And the National Institute of Standard and Test, NIST, in Washington, DC, they're actually running a competition right now to to standardize these algorithms. This competition is in the third stage, and four algorithms are, the, are running in now as the finalists. So these are the four algorithms we have chosen, Sabre, Kyber, MacLeese, and NTRU. And you, as you can clearly see, for the ready-made HPCs, it's very difficult to identify them, right? They're all bundled up, each over the other. So for fine-grained precision, we propose tailor-made HPCs, which are again designed for security primitives, similar to the custom-made HPCs. The difference, we're sampling dynamic assembly instructions instead of static assembly as we were doing in the power grids. So we monitored several instruction types like load, arithmetic, store, Boolean, branch, and also we monitored the program phase, and as well as their combinations. So if you monitor the load followed by load HPC, you can see that you can clearly identify each of these post-quantum cryptography algorithms, right? The variation is very discrete. There's very less overlap between them. So we developed these for post-quantum cryptography algorithm. We benchmark these. 
And we collected these ready-made HPCs, and these are the tailor-made HPCs. After feature selection, we found out these are the best tailor-made HPCs. And as you can clearly see, the tailor-made HPCs furnished an accuracy of almost 100% for all. So it can easily identify the kleptographic attack. This is not a ma malware attack anymore. We are trying to identify kleptographic attacks, which are like weakening our kleptographic implementation. The biggest gain was for classic Macalis, which gave a 27, almost a 27% gain from 73% to 99.97%. So this paper actually is being presented this week in uh, ES week, Embedded Systems Week, and it will appear as part of the SEMT ECS proceedings. Now let's take a step back from malware detection and look at privacy violation. So many of us have kids at our home, right? Actually, I was talking with Spiders today. He was telling me he has a two-year-old kid. And kids these days own their own mobile devices. They use it for entertainment purpose as well as for educational purpose, right? So we see kids playing uh, Angry Birds or maybe some other apps like TikTok. Or there are some educational apps like Baby Bus. So, uh, so the number of children owning smart devices was 1% own tablet in 2011. It has grown to... 41% in 2018, right? Now, what's the risk of this? The crime, cyber crimes against children have increased many fold. There was this big news in UNO Kids, if you have been keeping a track of this information. UNO Kids is a top popular educational app for children, and it, the data breach exposes the information for 700 children. This is a very serious issue, because this can lead to child trafficking if somebody knows personal information of children. So how to protect against this? The Federal Threat Commission, or the FTC, has developed a rule called COPA, which is Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which says that if you develop an app for the children, if you say that this app should be used by children aged 2 to 13, you cannot transmit some information. By the way, if you are not aware of this, any app that we use these days transmit information. It's not only Uber which transmits our location information. If you are using Facebook app or um, any game that you are playing, maybe Angry Bird, Angry Bird transmits a lot of information, by the way. And one of the, so you know that, like, for example, when you are playing, say, uh, when you are using TikTok and you have browsed something in past, like, for example, you are browsing how to get, to get to Grand Canyon, right? You suddenly see tickets, flight tickets from here to Phoenix or flight tickets from here to Las Vegas or helicopter tours from Las Vegas to Grand Canyon pop up during the game. Why does that happen? There's something in your cell phone called advertising ID, okay, that stores this information. And these apps trans this, transmit this information back to the advertiser. So they know exactly what you're interested in. If you're interested in travel, they will pop up. So for example, Edin took me to a Lebanese restaurant yesterday. He was probably searching for that. And I'm pretty sure after some days, he will have pop-ups, the best Lebanese restaurants in RDU area, right? So these things happen. We all know of this. But imagine how critical this is for children. Uber. You know Uber transmits your location, otherwise the driver will not know where, you're, where you are to get the car. So imagine a children's app transmitting the location. If there's a child somewhere in this area, if that location goes to a child trafficking agent, that there's a child aged five to six located in this area, do you think that's secure? That's actually really, really bad, right? So although FTC has made this rule, but unfortunately due to lack of strict regulations or guidelines, a lot of apps don't follow this rule. So what does the FTC do? The FTC periodically punishes people. So, for example, Baby Bus was warned. Facebook was imposed a $5 billion penalty. Inmobi had to pay almost $1 million. And TikTok paid $5.7 million. Okay? So TikTok has a huge lawsuit against FT with FTC going on. So you can follow that if you want. So anyway, the problem with existing COPA violation detection is it's not scalable. So there is one website where you can type the name of the app, and it will tell you whether the app is COPA compliant or not. But as a, per, as a guardian, you will have no way to dynamically test whether the app is COPA compliant or not. Why that website approach is not scalable? Let's take, the, take an example of, say, TikTok. Okay? So suppose TikTok is installed in your cell phone. At, you installed it maybe yesterday, and then you checked online, you saw it's COPA compliant. You probably gave it to your son or daughter to use it. Now what happens, these apps update them periodically, right? And they updated them without your permission. They get updated. And suddenly during one of these app updates, the TikTok app becomes non-COPA compliant. It's transmitting location information. 
you cannot go and check in the website every time you use the app, right? So it's not COPA compliant. And specifically, the website guys might not have been update, updating the website, right? They, they cannot update every time the app updates itself. So as a result, it, it might change from COPA compliant to non-COPA compliant, and you are not aware of that fact at all. So how do you handle this scenario? So we developed an HPC-based method to detect COPA compliance. And this paper also appeared in IEEE tips last year. And this got significant media coverage in NBC Austin, CBS Dallas-Fort Worth, Science Daily, and UTG News. So we call our paper COPSHA. So now let's take a look at what are the disadvantage of using HPCs as antivirus system. One big disadvantage of using HPC, still now we are seeing all the positive thing about HPCs. If they're non-deterministic. The same program running on the same system, at the same environment, can have 5% difference in HPC readings. Requires a high false positive rate, which I described before. And HPC readings inside a virtual machine differ from those on actual hardware. And so therefore we propose a trace buffer with malware detection. What is a trace buffer? Let's take a step back and understand what is a trace buffer, and then we will get back to our malware detection story. So introduction to trace buffer. So this is a very simplistic picture, and Aidan, don't kill me for this. This is a very simplistic picture of how a chip is designed, right? So a chip is implemented at the gate or RTL level, where it goes through pre-silicon verification. Then once the chip is manufactured, it goes through two tests, manufacturing testing and post-silicon validation. The difference between the two is manufacturing testing is used to check for electrical errors like shorts and opens. Post-silicon validation is used to check for functional errors. Now, as you can clearly see, a functional error can be only in one chip, right? Now, as the reason why we do a post-silicon validation after the chip is manufactured is because of the reduction in feature size and time to market and increase in circuit complexity, a lot of bugs escape the pre-silicon verification phase and get manufactured in the manufactured chip. So uh, uh, functional fault will be same for all chips in the die, but the electrical faults will differ from each chip in the die. So each copy of the IC is used for electrical manufacturing testing, but post-silicon validation, only one chip of the die is sufficient. So design validation complexity have been growing over the years, and post-silicon validation as a percentage of total design resources have been growing exponentially. Because this is a very critical thing. So if any of you graduate and work as a post-silicon validation engineer in any of the design houses like Intel, you will see that their job is like you will have to be 48 hours in the lab, no sleep, nothing. So you will be, basically the idea is to boot Linux on the chip. If you can boot Linux on the chip, you're successful, okay? And you need to re reduce the respins, right? Respins means how many times you have to change the chip. So this is a very critical job. So what is the problem with post-silicon validation? The problem is it has limited observability. Let me give an analogy. When you are running a C, Java, Python program, I hope all of you have write one of these languages. What do you do if the program doesn't work according to your thing? Or do you get a segmentation fault? What do you do? You introduce breakpoints. Run it on a debugger, introduce breakpoints, right? Now imagine the same thing you're doing here. You cannot introduce a breakpoint because the circuit is already manufactured, right? You cannot break open the circuit. All you can observe are the internal and uh, uh, the input and the output signals. So what did researchers come up with? They come up with something called the trace memory. So the trace memory stores some of the internal signal states. Now, this is like a breakpoint, but the difference is it's already designed pre, pre it's already there pre-designed during the design, pre-manufacturing, right? So you already know which signal values you will be observing. You cannot change those values dynamically. It means you can always do that using a multiplexer, but that will take up a huge memory overhead. So uh, the trace buffer stores some internal signal states, and this is less than 2% of the signals are chosen. So the question is which signals to choose. This is, a, again, an overview of how post-silicon validation is done. The test inputs are applied to the logic. The trace signals go to the trace buffer. Trace buffer has two parameters, width and depth. Width means the number of signals you're observing every cycle. Depth is the number of cycles over which it is observed. So 32 is the width there, and 1024 is the depth. So which signals you will obtain? So as I said, 2%. If you have a circuit with 1,000 signals, 2% means 20 signals. Which 20 signals will you obtain? You cannot do a trial and error. So the logic that people use is restoration. Restoration means you're observing 20 signals for say 1,024 cycles. How many of the rest 980 signal states you can restore using these 20 signals? So you will choose those 20 signals which can restore a maximum of the 980 untraced signal states, right? So this works by two ways, forward and backward. Forward, as you can clearly understand, you're tracing the input, restoring the output. 
In this slide, we'll take the example of a two input AND gate. However, this can be extrapolated for other gates also, like OR gates, NAND gates, NOR gates, and multiple inputs. The convention will be anything we have in red or maroon is, means we are tracing that. Anything we have in black means we are restoring that. So in the first picture on forward restoration, you are tracing A, and if A is zero, you know that C is also zero, right? Then in the second one, if you have, you're tracing A and B, if A and B are both one, you know for sure the C is also one. Backward restoration means you're tracing the output and maybe one of the inputs and, and restoring an untraced input. So in the first picture, on the bottom row, you're tracing C, you know C is one, you know for sure that A and B are both one. In the second picture, you're tracing C, C is zero. That won't give you what A and B are. Now if you're tracing A and C, A is one, you know for sure that B is zero, right? Now in the third picture, you're tracing C, C is zero, A is also zero, you have no way to know what B is. B can be one or zero. So backward restoration fails in this case. So let's take a small example how signal restoration is done across a circuit. This is a small circuit I took with five flip-flop. And uh, A, B, C, D, and E, you are tracing C every cycle, that's why C is shaded. The table on the right shows the various signal values and how their restoration is done. And X means that value couldn't be traced or restored. One or zero means the value is either traced or restored. C is traced every cycle, that's why C has no excess, and there is like a shading here. So tracing C in cycle zero means you can restore D in cycle one using forward restoration, right? Then C in cycle one is one. So you can do a backward restoration and restore A and B in cycle zero. Now knowing B and C in cycle zero, you can restore E in cycle one using forward restoration. So you can see you are, you are tracing only four states and you are restoring 13 states altogether, right? So now let's get back to our malware detection story. How can we use trace buffer with malware detection? So when I started working on this topic, I realized I have been working on trace buffers for almost a decade of my life, during my PhD and also in my industry. So I realized that these trace buffers are sitting idle. The trace buffers are there in this computer, your cell phone, your tablet, everywhere. But they're not doing anything. They're used to make sure the chip is functionally correct before sending the chip to a customer. Right? But at the customer end, they're not doing anything. So what, how can we use them? We can use them for malware detection. Advantages are they can be easily accessed through a JTAG interface, and they leave hardware footprints when a software is being executed. So any software you are executing on the, on the system, that leaves the hardware footprints on the trace buffer. So the repurposing the trace buffer has two advantages, has several advantages, sorry. It has the benefits of hardware-based malware detection, the basic benefits. Do not incur any performance penalty. It can work irrespective of how the software is running. You do not need to stop it. Supports low latency, as we'll see. Supports low false positive rates. We had a couple of papers in IEEE DAC, sorry, IEEE DAC and IEEE TCAD. So we used an open Python platform here, and this is a Kintex 7 FPGA. We used an open Python platform, which is a spark breath processor developed by Princeton University. And we ran on actual hardware, not on virtual machine. None of my experiments are done on virtual machine. So we have Gavgite or Mirai botnets. Gavgite is a very popular botnet for those of you who are interested in this topic. It was developed in the country Colombia and it infected a lot of digital video recorders. So we took a total of 400 samples and the trace signals we obtained using SIGFET tool, which I developed during my PhD. And we used this for machine learning classifiers. So as you can clearly see, the latency is very low. It's a few hundred cycles. If you're operating at 1.6 gigahertz, it's less than a microsecond. A typical antivirus software takes in the range of millisecond, right? So basically, this is three orders of magnitude faster than an antivirus software. We have a very high true positive and a low false positive rate. We did a malware family cross validation, it means we are training on one family of malware and trying to identify on the other family of malware. We got significant good accuracy. We increased the trace buffer width. What that does mean? That means we are getting a more detailed view of the internal circuit, right? When we get that, we expect better performance. So we're getting higher true positive rate and lower false positive rate, which is quite expected. So a summary of this part is the debug hardware efficient in malware detection. We can clearly see the challenges. Which signals to choose for malware detection? Currently, we're just using the post silicon signals for malware detection. But what if you're given a budget of selecting more signals? Which signals will you choose? Will you use different signals for different malware types? Like, will you use a set of signals for virus, a set of signals for worms? Can the machine learning algorithm be explainable? Can it explain why this particular program is being, uh, is being classified as a malware, not a benign program? 
how to improve the machine learning classifier latency. I told this is a low latency system. But however, if the machine learning classifier is not running fast, that creates a bottleneck. And then if the hardware secure, which we're going to talk about now. So till now, we assume that the hardware as the root of trust is very secure. But is that a good assumption? Let's explore that. So as I was mentioning, in old days, IBM used to make everything themselves. They used to have their own in-house fab, in-house EDA tools, in-house IPs. IBM actually, if you are aware of this, still uses their own layout uh, timing tool, which is called Einsteimer, which is probably the best timing tool out there, better than Synopsys, Cadence, or Mentor. So right now, everyone, there are a lot of players involved, right? This whole distributed supply chain has created a lot of security risks. Let's look at some of the security risks that we have here. One is the most popular is hardware trojans. So hardware trojans are malicious changes to the design, intentionally done by an attacker. Imagine, as I was telling the Apple and Samsung example, suppose Apple asks Samsung to manufacture a chip, Samsung creates a counter that will just count till one year and then stop the chip. So you buy an iPhone, which after one year, it totally stops altogether, right? Totally stops. You would blame Apple. I paid so much money for a phone and it, it's not working after one year. But it's not Apple who has to be blamed, it's Samsung, because they did put that circuit inside. That circuit is called a Trojan. A Trojan is a malicious intrusion which is used to do some modi harm the circuit. It can either functionally, functionally produce some malevolent activities like DOS attack, denial of service, or it can spy on some chips. So imagine a military chip. There's a, it's being manufactured by a country which is not in a good relationship with the US. That country can create a chip that will spy on the data and transmit outside. For those of you who know, there was this Bloomberg News article that came out a couple of years ago about Amazon's chip being spied on, right? So the two components of a hardware Trojan are trigger and payload. Trigger means the condition that will activate the Trojan, like the counter we just talked about in the example. Payload is the effect of the Trojan, like shutting down the chip, right? Trojan detection can be functional, side channel, you, you can use side channels to detect trojans, you can use functional uh, to detect trojan functionality. But both have a problem. Let me explain to you why the problem is. Let's take an example of an AES, Advanced Encryption Circuit, uh, Standard Circuit, right? AES IC. The number of inputs is 128. If you have a trojan which is activated by only one combination of the inputs, what is the probability of that combination? One over two raised to 128, right? That's a very low probability. So you have to literally go through all the combinations to activate the Trojan. Remember, the Trojan is functional, right? So this is a very difficult thing. So we are developing actually various EDA CAT tools for detecting Trojans in our lab. The other issues in security issues in IC are counterfeiting. Counterfeit is imitation of critical ICs. So basically, what happens is you have an IC, you create an imitation of the IC. So you create a fake IC. Sometimes you don't even create a fake IC, you take a recycled IC. You know ICs have a lifetime, right? Three years or five years, whatever it is. You take an old IC, clean it up, and just sell it in the market as a new IC. And I don't know how many of you, I know Aideen was there in DAC 2019. There was a very good talk by a Cisco VP. He showed that a fake Cisco IP, IC looks more real than a real Cisco IC. So just by looking at it, you cannot identify whether it's a counterfeit or not. And imagine, if this is in our Air Force or military, the US Air Force has actually a substantial number of counterfeit ICs. So this is a cause of national security. Then reverse engineering. So somebody can reverse engineer your design and send it to the market. Let's, let's imagine uh, I open a new company called Orange. I buy Apple sizes, I reverse engineer Apple sizes, and I sell it in, I manufacture it, sell it in the market. Suppose Apple sizes cost, just give them a ballpark number, say $100, right? I sell it in the market as $50, because I don't have to pay for R&D and whatever Apple did. I just reverse engineered, manufactured it, and my profit margin might be small, but I can, st I can still make much more uh, sales compared to Apple, right? Overproduction means, this Apple, let's take the Apple and Samsung example. Suppose, suppose Apple gives Samsung a bu uh, budget of like 1,000 ICs to manufacture. Samsung manufactures 2,000 ICs gives 1,000 back to Apple, and the rest 1,000 sells on its own in the market. It doesn't have to pay its R&D engineer for Apple ICs. It can still sell at the same cost. So how to defend against these issues? We are developing a new technique called watermarking. So watermarking, what does it mean? 
That means that, you know, there are watermarks in paper and so on, right? Even in some currency wrote, notes. Like if you are from India, you pr pretty much know that Indian currencies have a lot of watermarks. If you hold it against the light, the watermark appears. So watermark is like a small circuit which will only be activated under certain input combinations and it doesn't do anything to the functionality of the circuit except serving as the authenticity. So imagine Apple created a circuit, I copied everything on Apple's circuit and named it as orange and sold it in the market. I didn't, I don't know, I just copied the netlist. I don't know what the functionalities are. So I copied the watermark also. Now I'm selling it in the market as orange IC. Same performance, everything same, but I'm selling it at half the price. What Apple can do is, Apple can purchase one of my ICs test it whether the watermark is present. If the watermark is present, Apple can sue me in a court of law with legal proceedings, saying that, so this watermark was not supposed to do anything in your IC. This was supposed to be a watermark for our company, but you created, you copied our watermark. That means you basically copied our design. So we, we are developing techniques to improve watermark and detect this type of counterfeit or reverse engineered ICs, okay? So to conclude, malware a real threat in today's world, and it's a very scary world around there. Our hardware can be used as root of trust. We saw that HPCs can be used in securing embedded and cyber physical systems. Debug hardware provides high true positive and low false positive rates and low latency as well. A distributed manufacturing environment introduces security threats in the hardware which needs to be addressed till we assume the hardware as the root of trust for securing our IoT systems, okay? Thank you, everyone. Questions? Sure. Uh, my whole question. So um, the uh, uh, hardware-based malware architection mm -hmm. that you talked about, uh, whether it's uh, hardware performance count or trace buffer based, they all require the operating system to grant the antivirus software some privileges to configure the tracing infrastructure. But wouldn't that make the antivirus software become itself become a security concern? Because if it has a access to this process of tracing process, will be able to bypass the work to memory and look at other programs, memory spaces, that wouldn't that be of concern? That's a very good question, actually. So the question is, if the HPCs or the ETBs, the, the two hardware that I mentioned, they are accessing the OS, won't the antivirus software be able to escalate itself and downgrade the privileges, right? So that's a good question, and what actually can be done is, this whole thing can be done without the help of an OS. So for example, the ETBs, these are hardware. If you want, you can trace these values without the need of an OS directly to a machine learning unit, which will be inbuilt in the hardware, right? You don't need an OS to access the ETBs or the HPCs, right? So they can be actually hardwired from the HPCs or the ETB registers directly to the machine learning unit. And that way you can just get rid of the OS and work on this. That's why when I talk about this, uh, these um, um, pacemakers, Pacemakers hardly have an OS. So you can still employ these techniques without need of an OS in a pacemaker. Okay? Yes, Sita. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yes. That's a good question, Sital. And actually, I cannot and will not give the answer right now because we are working on a paper towards it. <laughs> we are trying to develop why this structure developed. But one thing I would like to mention here is, you saw we are using very simple classifiers, right? Because remember, one of the objectives was to keep it low energy to low overhead. If you use a CNN, that itself will occupy a huge energy. So we are trying to use very simple classifiers like random forest or very simple multi-layer perceptron neural networks and so on. Okay? Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so hardware counters, uh, yeah, as you said, they have low overhead and uh, yeah, like sometimes they provide a very uh, high accuracy. Yes. Of uh, detecting what hardware is actually doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one kind of concern is that uh, these uh, hardware performance counters they leak information. Yes. Right? So they actually, when you enable a lot of these counters, mm -hmm. they enable opportunities for these. Uh, Channel or side channel attack. True. Yeah, so how would you balance you know, kind of the capability of detecting those things and all at the same time do not want to leak too much information? That, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So let me answer it in three steps. 
The first step is, if you are using the traditional hardware performance counters, they're already there in the system. So anybody can access them. So if you consider the ones like the load misses, branch misses, and so on, they're already there. We are not adding anything new. Now if you talk about the fine grain that we are adding, which will give a more detailed insight and get a side channel view. This can be handled in two ways. One, as I mentioned to him, the hardware performance counters can be directly hardware to the machine learning unit without any physical access by the external user. The external user can only see the machine learning unit's result. It can only see whether this is a malware or a, or, a, or a benign program. It cannot tap into the look at the HPC values. The other thing, if you really want to protect at that stage also, you can have a small homomorphic encryption unit fit with the hardware performance counters that can encrypt the value and then send it to the machine. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay, does that answer your question? I'll just hold this. Yes. Sure. Question about the, not about the accuracy, but about time to detection. Mm -hmm. Which is a critical concern for scientists. Sure. As in one of your uh, works, you show that with, when you use a trace box, mm -hmm. it becomes a very low overhead. Mm -hmm. But what about other systems? Um, so have you cons um, have you analyzed like how do we minimize the time to detection, or is it like um, at the level where you can, for example, um, detect ransomware mm -hmm. um, in a very short amount of time? That's a, that's a good question, Aidan. Actually, we haven't looked into this, but this is one of the thoughts that we have in mind where we are looking into. So there are a lot of factors involved. First, to, to get the HPC or the ETB values, right? Get the trace values. Then transferring the trace values to a machine learning classifier. We're trying to see how fast the NOCs can work because the NOCs network and chips are the ways we can transfer. And then how the machine learning classifiers can work. So we are trying to optimize the machine learning classifier performance, developing a random forest hardware, which will run at speed. Right? That's the fastest you can do, uh, rather than running on a coprocessor. So that's what we are doing till now. But this whole NOC channel, we are still investigating. We haven't had an answer for yet. So and what would be the, the holy grail? So what's the, the ideal time? Uh, no, of course, as I mentioned, current antivirus software works in the order of millisecond. Anything less than that, that will be good. And as we can show, this worked in microseconds. So if you can have in microseconds, it's very good because the faster you detect, the faster the response time is, right? Imagine this is an automobile. You are driving a car, and suddenly a message pops out that your car has been infected by an anti malware. The faster you detect, the less time the malware gets to infect the brakes, and the more time you get to go to the shoulder or get away from an exit and take control of your car, right? Any more questions? Sure. Uh, learned about it in the presentation. So, what is the advantage of trace buffers over the regular DFT chain? Oh, the, the trace buffer, the regular DFT chain, uh, the scan chains you mean, they don't work at speed, right? Trace buffers can collect data at speed because post silicon validation, if you remember, I told you, is the functional bugs, not the electrical bugs. So, you have to work it at speed. Yes, Sita. Something similar, actually. Oh. So, uh, in the end of the uh, industry, we can actually run the structural test. Hmm. Yeah, but when you are doing yes, but when you are doing a complete functional test, like when I was in Intel and I was trying to boot Linux, you had you cannot run scans anymore. You can you have to just boot Linux in the system and run it. You have to do functional tests and you have to identify which are the internal observable si signals. Yeah, maybe, uh, company yes, <laughs> probably yes. Yes, yes. Any more questions? Sure. So this is a bit of a more of a philosophical question. Of course. Uh, do you think that given the amount of effort that it takes to secure these systems, does the um, benefit that they provide from the interconnectedness outweigh the risks that are associated with hardware attack? So like, for example, with a car, if I drive a purely mechanical car, like somebody could detonate an EMP, and I can still go <laughs> where I need to go. Yes. Um, but obviously, like, our society is moving more towards 
interconnectedness? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so this is an actually a deep philosophical question, and I don't know the answer. So maybe we should, we should shut down the internet altogether. <laughs> so we are all secure. So I, I always give this example, like when my, when I was a kid, my dad didn't have e-banking, right? He would go to the bank, write a check, and get order a receipt and get the money from the bank. He was very secure. Nobody's going to steal anything unless they physically steal his checkbook or something. Nobody's going to steal anything. But right now we are we are using our cell phones for banking, right? That's risky. So, of course, that risk. And uh, I honestly don't know the answer. I, I cannot tell you that, oh, yeah, sure, shut down the internet. We're all secure. Yeah. But, but this is very risky, especially given the fact, I think the bigger risk is what we didn't discuss today, is many of the nations, especially the nuclear nations, the nuclear uh, plants and the, and the switches are connected to the internet. And ima or the Air Force, these are connected to the internet. Imagine if, a, if an adversary starts creating a war due to this between two countries which have very friendly relations. And if you, if you have heard of the recent war news between Azerbaijan and uh, what was that? Armenia, I think, right? There was a recent war a couple of months ago. You know, that was the first war which had more cyber components than human soldiers. So we are going towards a system where there will be no human soldiers at all. We will not have an army, just an army of drones maybe, right? So. Any more questions? Let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. It was a great honor. So Spiros, should I log you out? Yes. Have you watched Battlestar Galactica? Sorry? Have you watched Battlestar Galactica? No, I heard about it in office. It's a great thing. So it's like the, so it's like the, uh, in an alternate universe. Uh, <clears throat> There are like human colonies and so on, and one day the side the cyborgs attack and they destroy all the all the ships except one which is not connected to the internet. All the other ships are connected to the internet, they are all gone. And the only one like this is called Spring. Because the one who's insecure. Yeah, exactly. So so you like the talk? Great talk, great talk. I'll I'll talk to you later. Sure, sure. Hi. Hi. I'm Raj. Yeah. I'll, I'll see you in a couple of hours. Yeah. I was actually in the Oh, oh. Uh, 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 I was in the middle of the I was in the middle of the I was in the middle of the I the that's okay. I, I'm available. Uh, I don't want to do it now. But you can my Yeah. Do you want to city list? Yeah. Okay. You're going to let me know. I have um, a small question. Sure. Uh, you're talking about um, oh, I was looking at this. I'm just going to ask him. Oh, uh, no. Hardware. Um, so I think uh, you were. Predicting like whether or not there was an uh, like, attack based off of one Yes, with my group, there are a few codes. I will see what I will see what I will see
If you are done with the lunch already, I'll be in my office. 